So Plato had a great idea, obviously, as one of the great philosophers, you would expect him to have great ideas, and he certainly did. And he touched on something profound when he had the idea. Except, in my opinion, that ultimately he got it the wrong way around. And let me explain what I mean. You see, he came up with this allegory of the prisoners in the cave. And according to this allegory, we are, as we experience reality, we are like prisoners in a cave. We are bound, trussed up so we can only ever see in one direction, and that is towards the back wall of the cave. And as we are observing this back wall of the cave, we see shadows, we see a, a shadow play unfolding in front of our eyes. And because that is all we ever see, we conclude that that shadow play that we observe is reality. Now up to that point, Plato is making a fairly interesting and profound observation about how we experience reality. Except then he goes and gets it the wrong way around. You see, according to Plato, what was going on was that the shadow play is our experience of reality and what the shadows are, are projections of some perfect platonic forms upon reality and how we are experiencing them. So according to Plato, there was out there in reality this essence of square or the essence of chair or the essence of dogs and that then manifested itself into the shadows into the manifestations that we experience reality of individual chairs dogs or squares but that are never perfect that are projections of this perfect chairness or dogness or squareness and that's where you got it wrong. You see, I think, I don't think, I am convinced, that things are actually the other way around. Reality is what's really out there. Reality is the only game in town, as far as I'm concerned. And we are all inextricably embedded into reality. We are part of reality. Reality, as I said before, transcends us. We cannot escape from reality. So we do experience reality in an immediate way and within our brains there is even a part of our brain that is still able to experience reality in this raw, undiluted, immediate way and that's a right, right hemisphere in our brain. However, in order to, for us to then communicate about what we experience in reality through language and to share our experiences with other people through communication, we need to represent what we are experiencing internally in the form of concepts and ideas. And those are analogous to what Plato saw as the shadows on the walls. But where he got it right completely the wrong way around is that those shadows are in actual fact more akin to what he saw as these platonic, perfect platonic forms. So as we experience reality, warts and all, with all its imperfections, with all its quirks and irregularities and its immediate impact on our lives, internally we categorize things. We create in our minds ideas of the things that we experience around us. And so we create in our minds the concepts of dogs and chairs and squares and we can even go further than that because those are the they, those are still fairly rough and ready concepts that are perfectly adequate for ordinary communication with other human beings about day-to-day -day things that we experience in the li in our lives in our immediate surroundings but if we want to create technology, we formalize this language into the language of science in which we can measure things, which, in which we can treat things, we can deduce things about squares, about 
matter, about chairs, about constructions that we build, and we can calculate within certain margins of error what we can, or we can or cannot do with certain things we build and that we then use in our technology. And we have reached, in this formalized language of physics, of technology, we have reached, reached a level of accuracy that allows us to create technology that is truly astonishing. But science itself shows us, in no uncertain terms, that while it is a hugely accurate way of talking about the world, it is not reality itself. Everything we do within science, every measurement, every calculation, has built into it what we call margins of error. We can only be precise up to a certain margin of error. Now, our science has moved on, our technology has moved on to a point where the margins of error are often negligible, to the point where it doesn't really matter how little it deviates from the value that we've calculated, the value will be close enough to it so that we know our technology will work, so that we know that how we've set out to manipulate reality and make it do what we want it to do will work and will make it do what we want it to do within our expectations. That is a far step forward from our original language, our original way of communicating with each other in terms of, say, for example, English, which was much fuzzier than that, which was much less precise than what we have done in science. But what we must never lose sight of, especially if we want to start thinking that we have a handle on the truth when it comes to reality, what we never must lose sight of is that none of these expressions, none of these communications are absolute. As I said, science has built into it every scientific measurement, every scientific prediction falls within a certain margin of error. No scientist worth his salt will ever claim that he has now grasped the absolute truth about anything. Nothing can ever be absolutely certain. There is no objective way of talking about reality. We, as I said, are completely inextricably embedded in reality and everything we will ever experience, ever know, ever measure, ever infer about reality is a result of this interaction with reality and both we and reality change to some extent as a result of what we learn about reality. Reality, of course, as Gödel has point pointed out, can never, as a self-describing entity, if we consider what we find out about reality, how we describe reality using our um, laws of nature, for example, reality can never completely describe itself. Anyway, that is mathematically proven to be impossible. So, we cannot say that it is ever possible to attain objective knowledge about reality. And if we can't say that about reality as a whole, then we can also not say it about any part of reality. We can reach a level of knowledge that is so accurate as to make no practical difference, granted. But if anybody is going to tell me that what is sitting out there is, in an absolute sense, a chair, then I'm afraid you've got it. Ask backwards.